Thanks, Brett. Uh, finishing seven years at MDPC, the church has an opportunity in your eighth year to have a three-month sabbatical, and I had this, that this summer. And you would think that a summer sabbatical would remove all stress and anxiety from people's lives, but not for a workaholic, type A, perfectionistic Norwegian <laughs> like me. I started my sabbatical up in Minnesota at Edina Presbyterian Church at a senior pastor's event. We had two nights and three days together, got some vision for our wider denomination going. And then I wanted to start the sabbatical with a five-day silent retreat an hour and a half northwest of there. It happened to be at St. John's University, and there's an abbey at that place as well, so I was gonna do five days without talking and then break that with a spiritual director monk. And so I arrived on campus. It is a 2,600-acre campus with the university there and the abbey there. There are 12 lakes there. There are hiking trails and snowmobile trails and cross-country skiing trails. And I decided to explore uh, during the first day of my five-day silent retreat, just the campus. But just to give you an idea of what five days without talking is, that's 120 hours, that's 7,200 minutes, that's 432,000 seconds. But who's counting? To try to unstring my bow, a bow that is always strung tight, eventually doesn't shoot straight. And so to unstring the bow is hard when you're used to and like to be in the middle of conversations and to let go of control and will the church be okay and will everybody uh, show up and will the pastors that preach, will all that go well and, and can I sit back, and so for the first day, I just wandered the campus. That was my first hike, which 2,600 acres, I just got to a small portion of the cam campus. I came to the football stadium and realized that John Gagliardi was the coach of that St. John's University for many years, the most wins in NCAA history, 489 wins, four national championships. It was Division Three, but still, that's significant. And the Abbey produced the first illuminated handwritten Bible in 500 years. They presented it to the Pope who gave it back to them and there's a museum of that Bible and I went through that museum. The first day was just exploring the various uh, campus buildings and then uh, going back and falling asleep and, and reading. Day two, hike two, I went around the biggest lake I got up at uh, early, but then I left at, at say 7.30 or 8. It was 50 degrees, I had a shell on. It was late May in, in um, Minnesota. And uh, walked around this lake, sun came up, there was a nice breeze, hour and a half walk around the lake to get to a chapel that looked back at the campus, amazingly beautiful. Stayed there about an hour and read scripture and prayed, then walked back another hour and a half, easy hike, day two. Day three, I went on the hike that was prairie uh, land. And you're walking uh, through these areas and you're hearing birds and you're seeing crickets and you're just enjoying and letting some of the stress and the anxiety of your life go. But then day four and day five came. It had rained the night before and day four and day five, my hikes were in um, forests and they were dark, <laughs> and they were imposing. I didn't have any bug spray, and when I got in the forest after rain, there were gnats everywhere. I don't know if you've ever been to Minnesota or Wisconsin or up north where there are bugs. And the gnats were just attacking me. The horse flies were uh, going, I was walking kind of like this and twitching like I had a tail and just trying to keep them off me. And I, I was far in the forest, so you can't just go back. You've got to finish the hike. And there are mosquitoes. And I'm going like this, and I'm going like this, and I'm going like this. I've got shorts on. And there are ticks. 
you know, there are not many ticks in Texas, but Minnesota and Wisconsin and upper Midwest, there are ticks which attach to your body and suck blood out of you if you've never had a tick on you. So I'm picking ticks off me. And it's dead in the middle of this forest and it's dark in the middle of this forest and I'm starting to play little tricks on me. I'm hearing things. There's snakes which I don't like snakes, and they're passing by on the left as I'm, I'm going, and I'm hearing snakes go here, and I'm hearing snakes go there, and I'm walking, and a snake goes right in front of me. Nobody else is around, and I decide to get a big stick. I don't need a walking stick, but if another snake gets really close, I'm, I'm gonna clobber the snake. <laughs> I don't like snakes. And there's snakes there, and then I'm hearing other noises, and it's dark, and it is the gnats, and it's the mosquitoes, and it's the ticks, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I didn't hear it coming, a mountain biker goes right by me, and my heart almost stops. I'd been the only person in this dark forest, and then a mountain biker goes by. And then I see, way out ahead of me, there's a guy walking toward me. And the guy walking toward me, I'm gonna greet him, but we're in the middle of the forest, is this gonna be a deliverance kind of experience for me? I don't want anything bad, and so I've got my walking stick, and it's not just for the snake, it's depending, and this guy gets closer, and he's unkempt, and he's unshaven, and I acknowledge him, I said, hi, and he doesn't acknowledge me at all, he walks by, and I'm thinking, this guy's gonna turn around if I'm not careful, and, and follow me and kill me. I've got my phone with me, but, MDPC will never know where I died and my wife will wonder about what happened to me and my kids might remember me, but it's over. And I'm thinking as I'm doing this and I'm swatting flies and I'm getting rid of ticks and I'm doing everything that I become allegorical in my life that there are on our lives easy hikes. And then there are day four and five hikes when we're in the forest, when we're um, alone, when we get anxious and we get stressed, when there are real threats from ticks and from snakes and from other human beings, and things can get overwhelming. And when that was happening, it occurred to me that if I hummed or whistled hymns and praise songs, the gnats and the mosquitoes were less prominent. It really was happening. And when I was praying or pondering scripture, my anxiety about a deliverance moment went down. And when I'd come to the crest of a hill and there was a little wind and I could see out of the forest back to campus, there was a perspective. I'm not that far from civilization. It's kind of close, even though it seems like I'm at a place a thousand years before there were motors. And I came over the last rise and the wind came up and I could see the sports fields of St. John's University, the field ho hockey field, the softball field, the baseball field, the football field was at a, in another place, but I could see all that and I was coming out of this forest-like place and I said, God, even though I'm less stressed now, I'm entering this three months, are you there? Will you be with me? Will you be with Sherry? Will, we, will you be with my kids? Will you uh, be with the church? Give me some sort of a sign, a Gideon moment. And I'm walking across the baseball field and I come across this feather. And this could be just a coincidence, it's just a feather. Feathers are dropped all the time, especially in rural Minnesota, but it's the only feather I saw the entire five days I was hiking. And it is a Cooper's hawk feather. I Googled it on my phone, and it's a beautiful feather. And when I saw the feather, it prompted me to uh, scripture. And this scripture came to my head. 
Isaiah 40, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even yous will faint. I sometimes consider myself a youth still. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted, but those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like wi- with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. And I don't know how to explain it to you, but pondering, you will mount up like a wing like eagles, felt to me like a word from God for the three months of my sabbatical. In my stress, in my worry, this feather felt to me like a talisman from God saying it was going to be okay. Not only that scripture, there are other scriptures. Psalm 91, he will cover you with his feathers. And under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. Go on. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were unwilling. I mean, God has feathers that will enfold us when we are overwhelmed if we will let God and this isn't really about feathers or a bird, but it's Psalm 34, 7 and 8. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. Now, I pondered a little bit what happened to me. I saw a feather, which is just a coincidence. But the feather prompted me to scripture, which says, God cares. God exists. And as we turn to God, we can receive help. Last Thursday in the communication, I sent kind of a summary link of what I did in the sabbatical, and I did read some books, and four of the books I read were on the promises of God from Scripture. Two of the books were by Charles Spurgeon, and in one of the books, it had this quote by D.L. Moody. I'm sorry, I'm at Philippians, but let me go to Philippians first, I guess. Philippians 4, well, before I say this, as I think about the issue of stress and anxiety, stress and anxiety can come upon us because of circumstances outside of us. They can happen because of work stresses, they can happen because of relational challenges, they can happen because of what's going on in the world. But fundamentally, stress and anxiety has to do with our relationship with God. Don't miss this. When you are stressed, when you are anxious, ultimately, it's an opportunity for us to grow in our relationship with God. Because stress and anxiety at its worst are practical atheism, is practical atheism. It's functioning as if either God does not exist or God does not care, or God does not have the power to help us. Does that make sense? And so when we are stressed, when we are anxious, take this as an opportunity to grow in your relationship with God. And that brings us to Philippians 4, which maybe is the most known text about stress and anxiety. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, let your gentleness gentleness be known to everyone the Lord is near do not worry about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus I experienced that peace of God in the ball field at St. John's and that's what we all want when we are stressed and anxious now what bothers me about this text is it says do not worry about anything What is wrong with Paul? Uh, Worry and anxiety is just an emotion. It's something that happens to us. We can't control whether we're anxious or, or worrying, right? But actually, when you get into the Greek, it's not saying the emotion. The emotion will come to us. It is crock potting anxiety. It is crock potting 
uh, stress. It is focusing and dwelling and, and staying stuck there. And in, in fact, Martin Luther said about this passage, we can't stop from birds from flying around our heads, but we can stop them from making a nest there. So with stress and anxiety, Paul is saying, don't, you don't have to worry about anything that's stewing without doing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, take your anxiety and stress and turn it into a prayer to God. Let God know what's really going on, how you're feeling, um, what you wish, what you need, and then over time, God's peace will come to you. Paul goes on to say, finally, beloved, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise. He's saying because there are all these things, think about these things, and the Greek is put these in your data bank. If there's a computer, save those things. Keep on doing the things you've learned and received and heard and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. He goes back to this peace. You want peace when you're stressed and anxious, pray. You want peace when you're stressed and anxious, focus on certain things. Which got me thinking about scripture and the promises of God. And four of the books that I read this summer were on the promises of God, two of them by Charles Spurgeon, and in one of the books, which I was gonna get to before, is a quote by D.L. Moody. Here's what he says, and this is a challenge for us this fall. Take the promises of God. Let a man feed for a month on the promises of God, and he will not talk about how poor he is, or how anxious he is, how stressed he is, You hear people say, oh, my leanness, how lean I am. It is not their leanness, it is their laziness. Come on, D.L. Moody, don't give us that hard of a time. If you would only read from Genesis to Revelation and see all the promises made my God to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to the Jews, to the Gentiles, to all his people everywhere, if you would spend a month feeding on the precious promises of God, you wouldn't be going about complaining how poor you are. You would lift up your head and proclaim the riches of his grace because you couldn't help doing it. Do you hear what D.L. Moody is saying? The scriptures are given to us for a lot of reasons so we can understand God's will, so we can recognize our sin and need for a savior so that Jesus can be the solution to our problem, but also it is the assurance of the character, the power, the love, the mercy, the grace, the help of God in our lives when we need God. And so the question is, do we have faith to see those passages as actually applying to us and not just to other people back then. Because they were first to the Jews, the people of God, or to the, the followers of Jesus in the New Testament, but according to scripture talking about itself, they're also for us. So let me get to several scriptures that you'll look in your small group about that, that point this out. Psalm 119, the Lord exists forever. Your word is firmly fixed in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth and it stands forever. The sum of your word is truth and every one of your righteous ordinances endures forever. We can trust God's word because it's true. Hebrews 6, 17 through 18 In the same way when God desired to show even more clearly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, the heirs of the promise are those who are Christians who follow Jesus, he guaranteed it by an oath so that through two unchangeable things, his character and the oath, in which it is impossible that God would prove false, we who have taken refuge might strongly be strongly encouraged to seize the hope set before us. We can believe in the promises of God because of God's character, and God makes an oath about it. Look at this, Numbers 23. God is not a human being that he should lie. Isn't that sad that um, one of the attributes of human beings is, after the fall, that we're liars? 
God is not like us in that respect. God is not a human being that he should lie or a mortal that he should change his mind. Has he promised and will he not do it? Has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? We either believe that or we don't. We either have faith about that and trust that or we don't. We are either willing to pray about that or we don't. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. Isaiah 46, I have spoken, I will bring it to pass, I have planned, I will do it. That's what scripture says about God. Joshua 23, 14, and now I'm about to go the way of all the earth, and you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one thing has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. Acts 2, 39, for the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord your God calls to him. Romans 4, this is talking about Abraham. When he and Sarah were old, they're given a promise by God that they'll have a a child. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God because being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. And a son is born. Now they take matters into their own hands at first and Ishmael is born from Hagar and it's a whole mess, but then finally they trust in God again and Isaac is born and the promise is fulfilled. A couple more quickly. This is the last one of, of... hopefully us being able to uh, think about scripture as promises not just to other people but to us. For in him, in Christ, every one of God's promises is a yes. For this reason, it is through him that we say the Hebrew is amen, which means let it be so or yes. So because Jesus says yes, we can say yes in truth. In, in response to the glory of God. So when Jesus says often in the parables or things, verily, verily, or truly, truly, or yes and yes in your English, it is uh, truly I say to you truly. So because God is faithful, you can have faith. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm faithful so you can have faith in what I'm saying. Um, now are there issues with promises? Are they all to us, or are there conditions? Yeah, there are conditions in some promises. Oops, I don't have that. Uh, I don't want that right now. Um, there are conditions sometimes in a promise, and let me just uh, pull out uh, one. Certain covenant arrangements are only true if we do something in particular. So for instance, Malachi 3.10 says, bring the full tithe into the sanctuary and put me to the test. See if I will not open the window of heaven for you and pour out overflowing blessings. So that's a, a promise of God. God will bless us materially in this case, according to Malachi, if we bring in the tithe, if we give 10% back to God. And so put me to the test on this. If you tithe regularly of your uh, financial resources, then that promise will be fulfilled. But there's a condition to it. Others don't seem to have a condition, like John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you believe in the son, you get eternal life. Some passages seem to suggest that God doesn't respond in our timing. There's the passage in John 11 where Mary and Martha say uh, their brother Lazarus is sick and Jesus come right away, he's deathly ill. And it says in the text in John 11, Jesus chose to wait two more days to go. I mean, think Mary and Martha are praying, They, they want their friend, but also who they think is the savior of the world to come so that their brother doesn't die and he doesn't come when they want. But after he shows up, 
He raises Lazarus from the dead. He talks to Mary and Martha about him being the resurrection and the life, and his glory is enhanced, and their faith is encouraged, and their brother is back. It wasn't at their timing, but the promise was fulfilled. And so sometimes we just have to promise that God is going to do it at God's timing. But back to the passage that we had um, at the beginning. Does Philippians 4 have conditions? for the promise. And if we're gonna use this, maybe I would suggest you do use it as your um, kind of theme verse for the fall. If our issue is stress and if our issue is anxiety, let me walk through uh, Philippians four one more time. Beginning with verse four. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. No matter what your circumstances, that's a condition for this. If you're under stress and anxiety, Paul says, rejoice. Now, he's saying this from prison in Rome. So he's not sitting on some uh, beach uh, with a, uh, a beer in his, in his hand and um, some chips and salsa just relaxing. He's in prison saying, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And he can say that in verse four because it says, the Lord is near. So when he's stressed, when he's anxious, he realizes that God is next to him. And in Matthew 28, Jesus has promised that. Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, okay? So rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, that's a condition. Part of the promise is the Lord is near, and then It says in verse six, do not worry about anything, do not stew without doing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Instead of stewing without doing, turn that stewing into prayer. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What if we did that for the next three months? What if we focused on rejoicing? What if we focused on remembering that God is next to us? And what if we focused when we're stressed and anxious on turning that into prayer? I bet you, you'll find peace. I dare you to take that test. And not only that, it goes on, finally beloved, the loved of God, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is anything worthy of praise. So all the promises of God in scripture, as you're reading scripture, how does this apply to me? Taking that seriously, actually believing it. He says, think about these things. Put these in your memory bank. Not the things you're worried about. Well, this might happen. She might do that. He might do that. The, the economy might do that. My boss might do that. Yes, all that might happen and it might not happen. Most of what we worry about never happens. But focus, put in your memory banks these things. Keep on doing the things you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul says and the God of peace will be with you. I wanna tell you, I had an amazing sabbatical when I put those things into practice. I was able to release MDPC to God and to you. And our associates and the guest speakers did phenomenally. They preached better than I would have on the topics that they brought to bear. We had summer celebration and it was the largest we've ever had. We came out of the summer in the black, in the budget, and I wasn't there for any of it, which humbles you a little bit as the senior pastor, but it gives you greater and greater confidence in God. And when I was stressed and when I was anxious, I just kept going back to the feather. He will renew you and you'll mount up with wings like eagles. You'll run and not be weary. And that happened, friends. 
I am a testament to the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Amen. Let me pray and then I'll... God, that's just an overview to get us started as the guys get into their small groups and talk about their own stress and anxiety and these passages. May it be rich conversation and may it send this men's life in the right direction for the fall. Somehow you've given us all we need in your word and your spirit and your presence to overcome the real stress and anxiety that we have in our lives. May we grow in our faith because of your faithfulness. And may we trust your word more and more for your glory, for our peace, and for the peace for those around us. In Christ's name, amen.